find here. Mm. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I should actually, I should have asked before um, when I had you all on screen, how many people have read the book, Frankenstein? Okay, so just shout out if you have, because I can't see you all right now. Yes, Rose, yes, yes. Oh. Yes. 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 No. yes, yes, I've read it. No. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. no, well, I hope the librarian has read it. Yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, you can mute yourselves now. So, um, great. So, yes, we'll be talking about Frankenstein today by Mary Shelley, written a little over 200 years ago, and uh, written when she was a teenager. And as I always say, I think it's incredible that a teenage girl could write the best monster of all time. And uh, so we'll be talking about her personal history, the science and history that led up to the writing of Frankenstein, the um, writing and editing of the novel, and Frankenstein's progeny stage and screen. Okay, well, we'll try to talk about all that. We'll see how much time we have. Okay, so, so obviously, well, this is, this is, well, the question is actually here, who is Frankenstein? So let's go to the next, who is Frankenstein? And indulge me in this one, if you don't mind, um, just unmute yourself if someone would graciously tell us who Frankenstein is. Monster. It was a creation uh, from a story that Mary Shelley had written, and she was influenced by some experiments going on, I think, in Germany. I forget who it was, but mm. uh, anyway, I, uh, I'm a right. big fan. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dina. The only thing, and, and so much of that is correct. The only thing is that Frankenstein is actually the creator of the monster. And uh, so thank you for playing this game with me because um, that's why I had to, I had to make sure that we were all talking about the same person, you know, and Frankenstein is not the monster. The monster actually in the book is never really called a name. It's called the creature or the monster or the thing or it. So, um, so, Okay, thank you so much. So Mary Shelley's origins, all right. Okay, so um, as you could see, these are her parents. Um, the gentleman on the left is her father, William Godwin. He was a philosopher and journalist. And on the right is her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft. Godwin was actually more famous in his lifetime than his wife, although you probably never heard of his name. Well. I had never heard of it um, as instead Mary Wollstonecraft became quite famous. Um, the sweetness of this portrait on the right is, is deceptive, I would say. Um, it really belies the reality of her life and her character. Her father was a, abusive and alcoholic. He beat her mother. Okay. As soon as she could, she left home and supported herself in London as a writer, editor, translator. She actually taught herself German, uh, Italian, and French in order to translate books and uh, articles. Um, and she also helped to, find, to support the family financially because the father also apparently did not excel at that. Um, okay, so she worked for as a governess for a while also. And she had very strong and um, progressive ideas about education. She believed that essentially the world was the, should be the classroom. And she had these two children, these two girls who were her, her students. And she would bring them out into nature um, in order to conduct studies of plants and insects. Um, but unfortunately that was not the kind of education that the parents had in mind. And so she was let go. She wrote a few books, one of them being A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was an early feminist text and also a small book on the education of girls. Now at that time, a girl's education had to do with comportment, how to behave, how to run the household. It had nothing to do with self-determination, let alone making a living, nothing about the wider world, but was confined, but a girl's life was confined to the small world of the home. In fact, they really weren't even allowed to be outside by themselves, okay? Fortunately, that's changed. So um, 
I should say before we leave this slide that Mary Wollstonecraft's portrait was commissioned by a friend of hers. His name was Aaron Burr. Okay, I think everyone knows who Aaron Burr is, okay. Famous or infamous for, um, well, the outcome of his duel with Alexander Hamilton, right? It's, um, they were friends and Aaron Burr had to leave the country for a while <laughs> after the duel and they became friendly in England. Um, it's actually a, a painting that's after, it's a copy of a portrait by John Opie. Okay. So, uh, so Mary Wollstonecraft and um, uh, <laughs> as I said, oh, okay. Um, and her father, what is his name? William Godwin, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> uh, fell in, actually, they fell, they met five years before they fell in love. They met at a party where Mary Wollstonecraft was holding court and well, he wasn't so thrilled about that. I guess he did have an ego of some type. So he thought she was loud and uh, too talkative. They meet five years later and they fall in love, madly in love, okay? And uh, they start living together and she becomes pregnant. Now, they were happy about this. They were both very much against the institution of marriage. Um, however, Mary Wollstonecraft had already had a child out of wedlock, uh, Fanny. And uh, she saw how it wasn't easy. The society didn't make it easy for the child. So they decided after she was pregnant that they would, they would get married just for the sake of the child, okay? So as I said, she was very independent and you know, she's pregnant and she's arranged for a midwife and tells her husband, you know, go ahead, you know, I don't need you. I've done this before, it's fine. Well, the midwife comes, she gives birth, but the placenta does not come out. And so the midwife calls for a doctor. Now, this is before they had any awareness that hygiene, you know, was a good thing when it came to surgery. So he pulled out the placenta. And unfortunately, Mary Wollstonecraft died 10 days later of sepsis. Yeah. So it was a very tragic beginning to, um, um, to her daughter's life. I'm sorry, I keep missing this. Thing. Okay. So, um, Okay, so her father, Mary Shelley's father remarried and opened a small publishing house and bookstore. Uh, it also became a salon where the local and traveling intelligentsia would gather. People like Erasmus Darwin, the father of Charles, you know, writers, scientists, and uh, Mary Shelley as a child would hide behind the sofa and hear these, these people expand on their views. Um, she didn't have much of a formal education, but she was educated by her father to some degree. Unfortunately, she doesn't get along with her stepmother who from what I've read, well, there's a good reason for it. Um, so she develops this really bad case of eczema and is sent to Scotland to live with friends for a while. When she comes back, she meets the young and handsome Piercy Bysshe Shelley who was an acolyte at that point of her father. They fall in love and they run away together. Now, Piercy Bishelli is married and has a small child already. And unfortunately also has a history of attraction to 16 year old girls, um, which is the age that Mary Shelley is at this point. Um, but her father wanted to capitalize on Shelley's family fortune because he, he felt that great men like himself should be rewarded, should be supported. Um, so, Piercy Bysshe Shelley immediately begins to try to raise funds through loans for him because actually he's, he's actually been disinherited from his family, but he doesn't want uh, William Godwin to know that. So Mary Shelley is 16, she's pregnant. She delivers the baby herself in their cold Garrett apartment. And a few weeks later, the baby dies. It's, uh, it's well, the second death related to birth in her life, close to birth in her life. And others have, uh, could you mute yourselves? Thanks. Okay. So imagine she's a teenage mother, essentially motherless herself. She's responsible for this child, but's not able to keep the child alive. Okay. So let's move on. Okay. And here she is, here she's about 40 um, and well, it's a lovely portrait, I think. 
even though she's bearing some skin, that was a style of time. She's actually quite a modest person. Um, and uh, we will now move on to the science and history of the time, which Dina gave an introduction to. Okay. All right, so think about this. This is the end. Um, this is the end of uh, the 1800s. I'm sorry, the 1700s that she's born. And can everyone mute themselves, please? I think I hear a bird. <laughs> okay. So um, there's major changes going on in the world at this time, right? Um, many revolutions, in fact. There's the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, where self emancipated slaves are fighting against. Colonial French colonial rule, and generally speaking, there is a move towards democracy and secular government for the first time. Okay, um, and even if you think about it, if you look back to the 16th century and Martin Luther, um, he says, you know, don't look at the church as an intermediary between you and God. You know, that a person has a direct relationship to God. So gradually, man is coming into his own and self-determination becomes an ideal rather than being born into subservience, whatever class you are born to. So, and there's the enlightenment, right? An intellectual movement that emphasized reason and individualism rather than tradition. There's romanticism. And under romanticism, you would have um, the Gothic, right? An interest in mystery, horror, gloom. And uh, we'll see an example of that now. And that now that things are becoming more secular and not religious, um, there's more experimentation, literally experimentation, science, scientific experimentation. Um, and these are, this is like now seen as a valid method of producing knowledge because before that there was more the Greek tradition of well-constructed arguments. Now you could actually attempt to prove things, right? So math came up, right? Math can explain processes like movement, the industrial revolution, it hastens the invention and manufacture of instruments, devices, mechanics, telescopes. So all these things are changing the entire world, everything, all these new um, ideas are coming into play. Now science is, um, it's not, it's still ill-defined and all-compassing. It's not um, categorized in different ways and it's called natural philosophy, okay? Um, and it's gradually involved from, evolved from a, a pastime of the wealthy, basically, to a profession. So before that, during the Renaissance, a duke would have his studiolo, his study in his castle, right, or in his palazzo. And there he would, he had the money to buy different little instruments, you know, maybe telescope type things and, you know, experiments with them. But now it's, things are being more mass produced, that's the Industrial Revolution and um, other people have access to these instruments. Then also there's a lot of travel, right? Um, there's a Dutch East India company. Trade has absolutely exploded. You know, we're beyond the Silk Road now of people um, getting around on camels, right? So um, there, there's a lot more interaction between countries and areas, okay? Another thing that might've influenced Mary Shelley was that her father published a book a book on the myth of Prometheus, the aspect of the myth, the myth where um, Prometheus creates a man from clay. So that could have possibly been an inspiration. Okay, so here we have um, Joseph Wright is the artist and it's the alchemist. Anyone wanna tell us what alchemy is? It's not it's a trick question. Supposedly, <laughs> supposedly turning lead into gold. And yes. it's also a metaphysical parallel to the, the actual or pseudo actual physical turning lead into gold. It's a more of a woo woo spiritual journey as well. Exactly. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Exactly. Um, sounds like she doesn't believe it, but yes, you know, the idea also that you could bring life to the dead, you know, um, bring life to an inanimate object and definitely uh, turning base metals into gold. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so Joseph Wright, uh, this is a great example of the Gothic, by the way. Um, I know it's a very dark painting, but, and I can barely see it, but there are pointed arches. If you have a, a Gothic painting or image, it's going to have arches, usually pointed arches, right? And it's going to have two points of light. Okay, so you see here, I don't know if everybody can see it, there's a little window in the background, right? 
really remote in the background. And of course, another requirement, there's a moon that you could see through the window and there's clouds in the sky, okay, back then. And then there's this light here. So two points of light. It, seemed, it would seem as though this is lighting, this window is lighting the scene down here. So here's a man in front of this contraption, right? And a beaker. Okay, so who this is is, um, and by the way, um, Joseph Wright was friends with Erasmus Darwin and all these other scientists. They were part of um, the Lunar Club, okay? They call themselves the lunatics. Um, I think it was supposed to be humorous, but it was called the Lunar Club because, and they were mostly scientists, people who were interested in science, but you know, there weren't many street lights, certainly not, there were no street lights out into the country. So they would hold their meetings on a moonlit night so that at, at the end, they would be able to make their way home by the light of the moon, as they say, okay. So, um, so this painting from 1771 depicts the alchemist Hennig Brand, who discovered phosphorus in 1669 through his experiments with boiling down hundreds of gallons of human urine, okay? Um, he was actually hoping to create gold, which is interesting that you think you would turn to urine for such a thing, but in any case, yeah. same color, I don't know. Um, and in the painting, the element first appears to Brands in the form of a bright light in a round glass bottle. Now, if you look at this painting, can you see that it's, it's got a, you would think it had a religious theme, correct? A spiritual theme. Because here's this person here, he's looking up, there's a light out of nowhere, actually from the moon probably. So, you know, from God, let's say. And he's, he seems to be having a religious experience, correct? And this is really so emblematic of the time because as I said, the secular is moving in, right? And religion is it's to some degree taking a back seat, okay? All right, so other things are going on at the same time. Okay, so um, in order to conduct these experiments, uh, very help helpful to have energy, correct? So there were two men who were very important to um, electricity. One is Luigi Galvani, who was a professor at the University of Bologna. He was an, anatom an anatomist, um, studied anatomy. And um, he believed that in his experiments, he would put together two, he attached two different types of metal to a dead frog. And often it would animate the legs, whichever parts that he, he touched it to, okay? Um, in the meantime, his colleague, Alessandro Volta, um, and if you see these words, Galvani and Volta, they sound a little familiar, right? Galvanic energy, volts, you know, voltage. Um, so Alessandro Volta felt no, that it was, that more was needed. It wasn't Al as Galvani thought that the electricity was inside of the frog. It was actually that the frog was just sort of, there was a current going through it from one side to another. So this is the first battery, right? Well, it's a model of the first battery you could see. It is old. And what it has is that um, it's called a volc voltaic pile. Okay. He was a physicist, Volta. And um, it produced a steady, the first steady electric current. So he had determined that the most effective pair of dissimilar metals to produce electricity were zinc and copper. And he created a column made of layers of zinc and copper and pieces of cardboard. Then he would add water to conduct the electricity. So this is about maybe two and a half feet high, uh, six inches in denominator, di diameter rather, and has electrodes, as you could see, that go from the battery to the body and they're inserted into cuts in the flesh when you're doing these experiments. Here is Volta actually showing Napoleon, demonstrating for Napoleon his, uh, his invention. So, so here is a Volta battery, right? And, uh, these are engravings that depict um, experiments, public experiments that Aldini, who was a nephew of Galvani, uh, conducted for an audience. And this was, you know, this was great entertainment at the time. People were assigned, interested in the science and also it was very entertaining uh, to say the least. So here you have just a close up of it. Here's the electrode going into the cut. 
Um, I love the way these disembodied hands do all the work here. And we'll look at the larger image here. So you can see they were very experimental, you know, but I'm going to actually read, I think it's on the next page. Let me see. Okay. Actually, does anyone want, want to read this? Would anyone like to read this? Rachel, do you feel like reading this? Thank you. On 4 November 1818, a scientist stood in front of the corpse of an athletic, muscular man. Behind him, his electrical equipment was primed and fizzing with energy. The scientist was ready to conduct a momentous scientific experiment. The corpse was carefully connected to the electrical equipment. Immediately, every muscle was thrown into powerful convulsions as though the body was violently shuddering from cold. A few adjustments were made and the machine connected a second time. <clears throat> now full laborious breathing commenced. The belly distended, the chest rose and fell. With the final application of electricity, the fingers of the right hand started to twitch as though playing the violin. Then one finger extended and appeared to point. It's Rachel, great reading. Um, okay, so you can see these were, well, we'll go back to the other one. Pretty impressive experiments. I mean, you can imagine that they might think that you could actually, in fact, bring someone back to life. Of course, would they want to come back to life as two heads together at the neck? I don't think so. But, you know, these are the early experiments, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And here's another example. Um, this is, you know, it's a great, it's a great um, illustration here. So in this case, they're, they've done it to his eyes, the person's eyes. And you can see all these people reacting as I would react, running away in horror and these people trying to be cool over here. So, um, so this was really what everyone was interested in at the time. So, um, so this is a bell jar, okay. Um, there's experimenting, experimentation going on in every case. So it's, it's like a bicycle pump attached to a glass bowl that's upside down. And the pump was used to extract air from the jar and create a vacuum. The vacuum pump was invented in Germany in 1650 and was used to demonstrate that elements in the air were necessary to sustain life. It wasn't until the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier discovered the role of oxygen in respiration that oxygen was actually, you know, understood to be the key element there, something that we take for granted knowing now. So what would happen would be, okay, um, these natural philosophers were in great demand now, and they would go around just like Aldini did and give these lectures. So you could actually hire them to speak and to come to your home for the weekend and conduct these experiments for your family and friends. You'd invite all your friends, okay? And uh, here we have this very elaborately dressed man who's a natural philosopher in a robe. I suppose he wanted to look um, impressive. And uh, he's, he is, has the bell jar up here. It's very hard to see, it's clear. There's a dove in it and he is conducting the experiment. Now, remember it's a Gothic scene. I don't know if you could see, but there are actually arches in the background, right? Here we have the window with the moon and the clouds going by, of course, typically Gothic. And then again, the two sources of light, right? Two points of light rather. And here you see the different reactions to this horrible thing because this bird is starting to suffocate. The children are horrified. Uh, someone, I don't know who it is, but someone said someone is fainting in here and I don't think I've seen that person, but um, these two people are thinking, was this a good idea? You know, um, the children are crying. So, um, so it really, um, well, still people were excited about it and kept hiring them. So it wasn't so bad, I guess. Uh, so in the meantime, you've got here, um, William Blake, I think maybe a lot of people are familiar with William Blake. He created his own mythology um, and it was, you know, basically cautionary tales about really that in a sense that man was getting too big for his britches and, you know, you needed to, that man or men, and I say men actually, <laughs> you know, um, 
needed to listen because even though they've learned a lot, there will always be more that they don't know because they're not God and don't confuse yourself with God. So this is a warning essentially um, and an important one to hear at this time, okay? Because things are getting a little bit out of hand. Now, let's say, up to, okay. So the thing is that, all right, they're experimenting on all these bodies, but where did the bodies come from? And they came from the criminals and, or the poor. Now, there had been universities for hundreds of years at this point, but with the emergence of real empirical science, you know, experimentation, the importance of the study of anatomy became clear. So before science had, uh, medicine had been taught theoretically, um, now bodies were needed, okay? So a university would be allotted maybe a dozen bodies a year. And these would be the bodies, as I said, of criminals or poor people. So a new profession was born that of grave robber, okay? Which apparently was very lucrative. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and what would happen would be that when you went to bury your loved one, everyone was aware that this was a risk, right? So you'd go there, there would be trees around the, <clears throat> the graveyard and you were aware that there were grave robbers out there hiding behind the trees, okay? So, they close up the grave and they would put twigs in different areas and memorize where they were so that they could tell if indeed the grave had been, you know, um, fiddled with. So of course, once they left, the grave robbers went to work. Now, what they would do would be, first of all, they would memorize themselves where the twigs were so they could place them back exactly where the family had left them. But if the family did dig up the coffin, they'd find that the body wasn't there but the clothes were. Let me guess is why the clothes would still be there, though not the body. It's, it's hard to imagine why. Would, would it be like a, to sort of pretend that the body was risen, that they were still there? That's, that's kind of interesting. Actually, that's a very, uh, very creative uh, idea, Rachel. Actually, it's because it wasn't yet illegal to steal a body, but it was illegal to steal clothes. So go figure. But you know, the laws hadn't caught up to this new profession yet, put it that way. So thanks for that idea. It's interesting, very mystical. Okay. So now we'll do the writing and editing of Frankenstein. Um, I have the plot synopsis here. It's two slides. I can read it if you like. Um, does anyone, I don't know if anyone has not read the book and would like to know it. Okay. Why don't I just read it? Or someone could read it if they want. <laughs> Dina, I, I can read it. Dina. Oh, thank you. Dina, thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. Captain Robert Walton, on an Arctic expedition, writes to his sister, describing an ailing but brilliant stranger he has rescued from the ice. This is Victor Frankenstein from Geneva. He tells Walton his story, beginning with a happy childhood, an unhealthy obsession with alchemy, and an engagement to his cousin, Elizabeth, at the behest of his dying mother. Uh, then in parentheses, it says alchemy, an early form of chemistry, whose chief aims were to change base metals into gold and to discover the elixir of perpetual youth. <clears throat> Victor enrolls at the University of Ingolstadt, where, mm -hmm. his in, where his interest in alchemy is swiftly diverted to chemistry. Still an undergraduate, he discovers the secret of life and builds the creature from dead bodies. When the creature comes to life, Victor is horrified. He runs away, falls ill. During a slow recovery under the care of a friend, Henry Clerval, Henry learns that his younger brother, William, has been murdered. Can you do the next page? Victor returns to Geneva where Justine, a beloved servant, is hanged for the murder. Victor suspects the creature, but has no proof until they meet on an alpine glacier. There the creature describes his first experiences, explains how he learned to speak and read, 
and convinces Victor to build him a mate in exchange for the creature ending his bloody rampage. Victor does build a female creature, but destroys it in disgust. His creature appears and warns him, I will be with you on your wedding night. Soon after, the creature kills Henry Clerval. Back in Geneva, Victor and Elizabeth marry. The creature kills Elizabeth. Victor swears vengeance and the chase begins, extending to the Arctic, where Victor is rescued by Walton. Victor dies. The creature appears on board Walton's ship, repentant and self-loathing. He determines to build his funeral pyre and end his life. Oh, excellent, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, so as you can see, there's a lot of death. And you know, let's just say that the monster, by the way, um, is really a lovely person in the beginning, <laughs> if you can imagine. But he does do some bad things, and that's in response to the way he's treated in life. Okay, so um, he's much more sympathetic, a much more sympathetic figure than you might imagine if you haven't read the book. Um, but he does kill. He kills. Frankenstein's young brother. He uh, ends up killing his Frankenstein's wife. Um, he frames a, a beloved servant for the brother's murder. Um, you know, he does a lot of bad things. Okay, so so what happens is that so let's get back to Mary Shelley and uh, and Percy Bysshe Shelley. So they are. Oh, Jane, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, that in. From my reading, I I remember the another origin of his turning murderous was his um, rejection by like the peasantry and you know anyone who encountered him, and that he he was created without this you know murderous soul, but that it was developed that he actually had a gentle bearing. Before, before being rejected. Definitely, I and mean, that's the way I read it also, I agree. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's born as a child, you know, and he's experiencing life in a sense as an infant initially, you know, an innocent child. And unfortunately, yes, goes out in the world. And of course people are, he's eight feet tall to start with, which wasn't common at the time, you know, but um, Frankenstein had decided to use to some degree, animals' bodies, because he thought they'd be easier to work with, the blood vessels would be larger. So to start with, he's nearly twice as tall as everyone was at that time, right? Um, and he does try at one point, you know, to, um, he, he lives, he hides out in a lean-to to, to this family in, in the country, uh, a lean-to to their home. And this is where he teaches himself French. He becomes fluent in French, if you can imagine. And um, actually, I think also German, and because he steals their books, and he listens and listens to them. And uh, the father of the family is elderly, and he's blind. So he hatches this plan that once one day, when the, the rest of the family is out of the, this little hut, that he would try to go in there and appeal to the father, since he's blind. He felt he had an advantage. Unfortunately. The family comes home and, well, that's the end of that. You know, they see what he really looks like. They see him as an intruder and a, a menace. And uh, in the end, he actually burns down their house, you know, in an emotional, you know, reaction. Um, but, and he's very literate also. I mean, he reads John Milton. He reads um, uh, Paradise Lost. He reads, uh, oh, well, maybe it'll come up later. I can't think of the name. He, he's reading all these incredible books and he's learning from them. So he's learning about morality um, through literature. Okay, so Mount Tambor. So what happens is that Mary Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, um, Mary Shelley is now pregnant for the third time and she and Lord Byron, um, this swashbuckling romantic hero who, by the way, had a club foot, which I was so surprised to learn. Um, but very dashing. And um, her stepsister, Claire, who was quite annoying and always a hanger on, and John Polidori, um, who was some, a friend and actually the personal physician for this trip to Lord Byron, okay, um, all decided to find some sunshine because it had been so dark and depressing 
during that period. Well, it turned out there was a reason for it. Okay, so they traveled down through a continent that really, because of all these revolutions and everything that was going on, had not, you know, witnessed travelers for a long time. Okay, it wasn't really a tourist spot, Europe at that point. But they go down to Switzerland. Um, Lord Byron rents a very fancy, the Villa Diodati, a fancy palazzo, and the Shelleys rent a much more modest one. But they hang out in Byron's place and it's dark and dreary and depressing, okay? And the reason why it's so dark and dreary is because of Mount Tambora, okay? In Indonesia, this is the site. Now Mount Vesuvius is here on the left, right? Look at the size of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius compared to Mount Tambora's eruption. And you know what happened in Pompeii, all right? That's Mount Vesuvius. So the entire earth was covered in this, this dark cloud cover for one year. It was called the year of starvation, um, the year of no sun. And uh, needless to say, it was pretty depressing. And besides that, who could eat? You couldn't grow anything. So it was only the upper classes, the people with the most money could actually purchase food. So it was, you know, the year of starvation. So a, a totally depressing time. So, um, so what happens is that they're holed up in this probably gorgeous palazzo in Switzerland, right? And um, getting bored and Lord Byron suggests a contest. The winner would be the one, the person who wrote the scariest story, okay? So, uh, well, guess who won? Okay, it was Mary Shelley. And it had taken her a couple of days to come up with the idea. And then she was just sort of having sort of a nap um, on a sofa chair, apparently. And she saw this image of someone bending over someone else's body. And this is what was the inspiration for the story. Okay, so this is actually, this is from the Bodleian Library in, in England. Um, they actually have the original manuscript, if you could believe it, of, um, of the story, Frankenstein. The, the entire title is Frankenstein uh, or uh, the Prometheus, what is it? I don't even know right now, where's my book? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I'm impressed by how straight she writes her lines because um, it goes on for many pages. There are little adjustments here some of them were actually done, edited by, it was edited to some, to some degree by Piercy Bichelli, but there are a lot of arguments about that. Uh, for some time, he was giving credit for the story, which people felt was, you know, misogynist, which I think uh, probably was. Um, and it has mostly been discredited. But here we have, let's see, it was on a dreary night. Okay, so I'm going to read, I might even have it on the next slide, let's see. Okay. So this is the beginning. It's quite famous. I'll only read a part of it. It was on a dreary night of November. And this is Frankenstein speaking, right? He's in, he goes away to university. He never even gets his degree because he gets, becomes so enamored of this idea of alchemy. Okay. And all of a sudden, in a bolt of inspiration, he realizes the origin of life and that he could create life. Okay. One of the amazing things about, or I think more intelligent things about the book is that she never lays out what that idea was, you know? And part of it is that in the end, of course, Frankenstein himself realizes this is dangerous information, but she leaves that vague because that is not the point of the book. The point of the book, it's much more psychological than that, right? So it was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils with an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the plains and my candle was nearly burnt out when by the glimmer of the half extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard and its convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. 
His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight back, black lips. So you can see what happens here. He is so um, engulfed by this passion to create a human being, to bring life to dead parts of body. And you know he's lost his perspective entirely. And then he sees what he creates and rejects his child immediately because this is his child, it's his creation. At birth, he rejects his, his progeny. And if you think back now, she's already lost two children, right? Um, Mary Shelley. And there she was for the first child, you know, really clueless about how to care for an infant and it dies essentially in her hands. Um, so this idea of birth and death is, you know, is extremely foremost in her mind probably. Okay, so um, let's see. And then the creature tells his story, which is so beautiful. Uh, Jane, would you like to read? Jane always, is Jane not available now? Okay. I'm here. Where where are you? Oh, actually, you can't have you can't read it. I'm so sorry. I don't think I have it up there. I think I only have it here. Sorry. There'll be something oh, that's else. All right. <laughs> There'll be something else. Okay. So this is the creature who finally gets uh, Frankenstein alone in a glacier, no less. Um, and he says, "It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original error of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct." A strange multiplicity of sensations, uh, sensations seized me. And I saw, felt, heard, and smelt at the same time. And it was indeed a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. Okay, it goes on and it's so beautiful, but it's such a description of birth, you know, that she's really trying to imagine what is it like to be born and have that experience of coming to know what we don't know, you know. Um, how to interpret the things around us and our sensations. So actually, Jane, the next thing is the last page. So maybe you could read from the light, if you don't mind. Yes, the sure. The page of the book. Got it. <clears throat> the light of that conflagration will fade away. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds, my spirit will sleep in peace. Or if it thinks, it will not surely think thus. Farewell. He sprung from the cabin window as he said this upon the ice raft, which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in the darkness and distance. Mm -hmm. Woo. <sighs> <laughs> so, what happened was that Mary Shelley wrote the story itself and then she realized um, it needed something else. So she bracketed it in another story to explain what was going on. And that is um, a man who is an explorer. So, you know, a natural philosopher, let's say, who is exploring the Arctic essentially. And uh, in the end, Victor Frankenstein ends up encountering this man who is you know, having trouble dealing with uh, the ice flows, etc., And um, he takes him in and learns his story from him. This is the first person that Victor Frankenstein, after holding the story in for all these years, he tells him the story. In the meantime, what is he doing? He's searching for the monster, okay? He's, ra he's tra traversing the entire, you know, entire, um, well, the land of Europe, whatever, looking for the monster. And uh, this is where he finally finds him. And there is, I have to say, there's, there is, um, Kenneth Branagh did a, not a film I would recommend. He, it's titled something like the true story, that it's the actual Mary Shelley Frankenstein story. Believe me, he's used a lot of imagination in the film, but there is a scene and, and Robert De Niro is the creature. And this scene at the end in the boat where Robert De Niro as the creature is sitting at the feet of Frankenstein who has just died. And De Niro says, he was my father. And I'm telling you what it is. It was almost worth all the gore in this film just for that moment, because it really says it all, you know, that that's what it's all about. He's been rejected by his father, you know? 
So um, very moving, strangely enough. So let's see. Okay, well, this was actually, this is interesting. Um, what happens is that Piercy Bischelli actually dies in Italy off the coast of Genoa um, in a boat with someone else because frankly, he doesn't, he's out boating, should not have been going out in that weather, doesn't know how to deal with a boat and dies along with the other person in the boat. And so, you know, she's left with her children and, um, you know, it's, it's a very sad thing. So she is helped at that point by a woman named Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. she gives Mrs. Thomas this book. And this is her 1818 edition of Frankenstein. And it has all these annotations in it. And one of the things that she changed, and it's not this page, I'm sorry, um, is that in the book, uh, Victor Frankenstein actually marries his cousin, um, which was not so uncommon at the time, I believe. And I guess at this point, she felt that seemed a little uncomfortable. So she changed it. And I really think she should have left it because <laughs> who am I to criticize Mary Shelley? But I think it worked better in the 1818 edition, that's my feeling. So, so what happens is that it's quite interesting. So that period in the Villa Diodati, um, you would have thought that Lord Byron and Piercy for Shelley would come up with masterpieces or at least stories, right? But they did not really. But who did was Mary Shelley and John William Polidori, um, who, was, who was this young doctor. And he came up with the first vampire story, if you could believe it. So Graham Stoker got the idea for the vampire from this story, okay? And it was published by, um, it was published under the name of Lord Byron and both Byron and Polidori said, no, it was written by Polidori. So, um, so I guess I won't read this whole thing just for time's sake, but basically what he did was there were vamp folk tales about vampires, you know, around Hungary and that area. But what he did was he created the character of the vampire as this suave, attractive man who of course lives by night basically and that women, women couldn't resist. So um, it's fascinating that these two, the vampire, and Frankenstein came out of this one uh, experience. It was just incredible, I think. There was something going on. Maybe it was, maybe we, it was something good about the tornado, uh, the, um, the volcano. So this is actually, this is the Francis piece of the 1931 edition. Uh, there had been a couple closer to the original publication, but, um, but this was, and this was published through her father who was making money off of her, let's say. Again, there's the points of lights, but it's just interesting because this is this would have been the only image that Mary Shelley would have seen of the monster herself. Okay, not what we've come to know. You know, no knobs in in the head, in the neck. Um, you know, not a flat head. Uh, so this would have this probably received her approval. Okay, so then what happens, of course, is that not long after the publication of the book, so, you know, of course it was published anonymously, you know, she wouldn't have put her name on it, she probably wouldn't have gotten it published, you know, as a woman. Um, so only people that she knew knew she uh, had written it, but um, not too long after that, a few years, it goes to the stage. So what, this is when these transformations start happening and people, you know, well, leading to our confusion about who was Frankenstein, let's say, okay. And the character of the, of the creature. So this is um, Thomas P. Cook, who is the first person to star in a production. And um, he was six feet tall, which, you know, was tall at the time. He was covered in green and green paint. And he actually was a mime, okay. So he was a very, you know, well thought of actor, but he was also a mime. And that is why we don't think of Frankenstein really as, as of, of the creature as speaking actually, because way back then someone was uh, describing him without speaking. So um, it, went, it went over very well. At the time, this is in London, there were major laws about what type of, um, 
theatrical performance you could have. And um, especially, you know, a melodrama with song and dance, there, there would be censors that would have restricted it if you didn't have some song and dance. You had to have song and dance in a drama, essentially, which sounds bizarre, but that's the way it was then. So sometimes the creature was dancing, <laughs> which does show up later on if you think about young Frankenstein, right? Um, so uh, anyway, and supposedly it was a very frightening and very successful thing. He actually um, did performed in it 365 times. So it was very popular. And Mary Shelley did attend uh, one of the uh, performances and she said, oh my gosh, I'm famous. She had no idea. So um, she wrote to a friend. And then we come, so then we come to the United States, okay? So this is the Edison Labs, which was, the studio was in the Bronx, our Bronx. <laughs> and uh, this is the monster, okay? Uh, it was actually, it was a long film. It was over an hour. Um, and, what, and what the um, director does, that's so brilliant because this is 1910, okay? This is a very early film period. And what he does is he, he builds, he creates an effigy of the actor, right? As um, the monster, and he's Frankenstein now. And he burns it and he plays it backwards so that it appears that he's born of fire, the monster, which was quite, quite brilliant, I think, at the time. So, okay. And this is Boris Karloff, who I have to say looks very handsome in this, I think. Um, so this is a very famous, this is huge. This is, I think it's like 12 feet high, this poster, a very famous poster and uh, a beautiful image of um, obviously Frankenstein and his bride, which didn't work out so well. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone's seen Bride of Frankenstein, but it doesn't end well, <laughs> which is actually the way it is in the film. And there's the wonderful Elsa Lancaster. And this is actually our last slide. So just, there have been so many adaptations as I'm sure that you know, and uh, Frank and Weenie is a favorite here. Um, Abbott and Costello, wonderful. Young Frankenstein, fantastic, which in some ways is more accurate than some other uh, of the film, but some of the more serious films, you know, because he's a sympathetic character, isn't he? Uh, the monster in Young Frankenstein. There was actually the Boris Karloff, um, Frankenstein was interesting because at that time there was censor there was censorship of course all across the country and the censorship often was local so what you could show in one town would be different than another okay and in part of part of Frankenstein now there is this other confusion that he's born of electricity which is not true in, in the book right but anyway if anyone has seen it in Frankenstein there's he is lifted up on a bed and there's lightning up in the sky, you know, he comes down and now he's, um, I can't think of his name, Clyde something. The actor is over him and, you know, excited and he sees he's moving his hands and he says, of course, he's, he's alive, it's alive. And, uh, and then he says, now I know what it feels like to be God. Well, the censors didn't like that. So in some cities, they would um, play loud thunder over that because certainly a man can't claim to be God, you know, so that was somewhat disturbing to them. So anyway, that's it. Anyone have any questions or comments? Thanks for listening. I, I really wanna thank you. I was, I'm never disappointed when you speak on a subject. Um, my one comment was that I read the book after attending an earlier lecture, I think it was in 2020, by a man who was known as Dr. Frank. I, I, yeah, I saw that, yes. Yeah, and uh, I don't know why I suddenly got the idea to read it, but I was not disappointed. I was surprised, though, to find the book 
for me was more about moral reckoning and the perils of of reaching too far into other worlds in a way and i you know i found it so beautifully written i was just in awe of it and i wasn't of course was involved in the story but i was not as focused on the on the horror of the monster as i was just this you know these these conflicts um of life, let's say. So thank you, Dina. Thanks, Jane. I, I mean, I felt the same way. I never, well, I had read it when I was a teenager, of course, and I loved it then, but not everything holds up yes. decades later. And it not only held up, but it was so much deeper than I remembered, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, you could, you could discuss this for years. There were so many layers. There's the feminist layer, you know, there's, um, and then some people feel that it could be a study of postpartum depression in some yeah. ways, you know, um, it's a remarkable book, no question about it. Hi, Dina. Hi. Um, can you tell more about what happened to Shel um, Shelley after the book? Yes, Mary yes. Shelley? Sure, um, let me just ask this. Um, well, you know, she didn't, she had no other relationships. I'll say that, unfortunately. Um, she did end up with a son that survived and, uh, and he did, and he, I can't remember who he married, but, um, but they did support her. And, you know, she did have a nice family life in that sense, but, um, but she did write another book, The Last Man. And that was something of a response to Frankenstein. It's not, I haven't read the whole thing, honestly, um, but it, it, it's essentially the same idea that, you know, that the creator hasn't foreseen their own reaction to their creation. So he, she was trying to address it again, um, but- um, did, yeah. did she become famous because of the book? Yes, she did eventually, yes, become famous, absolutely. She deserved to be, yes. I mean, during her lifetime. During her lifetime, yes. I mean, she didn't become financially successful, really. And her father was quite a problem. You know, he's a very self-centered man. And some people feel that factors into this, that maybe Victor Frankenstein was the embodiment of her father's, you know, narcissism. So, um, so that that's a difficult subject. You know, do we have a few minutes? Because actually, Excuse me, Sue. Um, I wanted to show, I think it's about a minute and a half, the original. Is that okay, Heidi? Do we have a few minutes? Yeah, it's fine with me. Okay, great. I wanted to show just a little piece of the original um, film, the Edison film, because it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Let's see if I could find it here. Where do I have it? Is it here? Let's see. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, this is, um, I'm not starting from the very beginning, but it starts from nothing, basically. We're, we're a little bit into the creation. And there's Frankenstein, so happy. second thoughts. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. It's it's actually quite accurate, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. they do spell it as because that's exactly. I mean, he he doesn't have second thoughts until the moment essentially the monster's eyes open. You know, but I love the way the director did it, played it backwards. I think it was pretty ingenious. So. She she wrote two books though. Yeah, yeah she yeah. two books. Two books. Oh uh, no, well, there, there might have been another one. I don't remember now, but. Those are the two main books that she wrote, yes. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting to see how this translates over the years where it began, which was terrifying. And, um, but just as the movies were progressing, how it, how it uh, just translated to the time. And that would have been super terrifying to see the hand coming out of this, you know, furnace and all that stuff. And anyway, um, very cool. Thank you for showing that. Sure, you can imagine, yes, because it looks like fire. The, it must've been terrifying to see in the studio at that time. So uh, yeah, I agree. Okay, so anything else? Um, did you see, uh, has anyone seen this movie? It came out a long time ago, uh, 1987 called Gothic. And yeah. the premise is it takes place in the chateau uh, on the Lake of Geneva, which I went to, by the way, it's still there that I think it's called Chillon and uh, where they wrote the story. Oh, it's you went and it's not called the Via. Your no, the audience. movie is called Gothic. Okay. Um, and I think it was filmed in that castle, which is, you know, it's a museum now. It came out in 1987 and mm. uh, Mary Shelley was portrayed by Natasha Richardson. No one's seen this movie. Mm. No. <laughs> is it scary? <laughs> What's it called? I don't think it's called Gothic, and it's okay. about their, you know, they're yeah. all living together, all these, um, and they and they write that, and she writes the book, like they have that competition. Oh, oh thanks, Dina. Dina wrote yeah. her last three books were Matilda, Valperga, and The Last Man. Thanks, Dina. Um, uh, uh, Dina. Yes. Oh. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. I just wanted to point out that if anybody is interested, there was really a wonderful production done by the Royal Theater with um, Benedict Cumberbatch and Danny Boyle, and they alternated roles. One night, one person would play Frankenstein, and then the other would play the monster. Wow. And you might still be able to see it. It, it may be, you know, maybe available, but it's Really, I don't, you didn't by any chance get a chance to see that, did you? No, I read about it. I didn't get to see it. Yeah, though. great, great production, really. Because, you know, the 200th anniversary was a few years ago. So, right, it was uh, covered in many ways. Thanks for that, Diane. I'll have to look for it. Think about that. So, I tell you, you know, I have a friend who reads it every year and has done that for decades. And I can imagine that, you know, each time you, I've, I've read it about four times, you know, five times maybe, you know, I learn different things each time I read it. I mean, and it almost depends on where you are in your life, I think, and what age you are at, possibly, you know? So yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I did definitely have that experience having read it as a teenager mm -hmm. and then reading it as an adult. I read it last year after that, that other uh, Frankenstein guy came in and, and did the, uh, the, um, uh, the presentation. And I got a completely different uh, take on it. It's of course, obviously, yeah. So it's interesting. I'll read it again when I'm ninety. <laughs> I make it. I hope you do <laughs> that. Actually, <laughs> thank it's you. It's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I think we progress in life. We need to reread things we think we've read because we bring something yeah. different. Understanding. Yeah. 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 I remember thank rereading you, Jonathan Swift and being so disappointed. Gulliver's Travels. I loved it the first time when I was a teenager and I don't know, it changed for me. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining me, everyone. Thank you so much, Thank Dina, you. it was great. Thank thanks you everyone so for much. joining in. It was very Thank enjoyable. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Heidi, you, for bringing it. Sure. See you at the meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.